The following four presentations are concerned with humanizing education through the use of technology. The first presentation will be by Susanna Melton, and her concern is the history of technology. She will review the contributions of Pressy, Thorndike, Crowder, and Skinner, and how they viewed the use of technology in enhancing education. Welcome to the joint presentation on humanizing education through technology. I am Susanna Milton and I will be taking you through an historical overview touching on some key contributions and moments in history that helped to shape instructional design and learning. The historical roots of instructional design can be traced back to the age of Aristotle. Aristotle believed in the laws of association and the laws of contiguity and frequency, and these are still viewed as important aspects of learning. St. Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, addressed perceptions of learning. He lived at a pivotal juncture of Western culture. The arrival of the Aristotelian corpus in Latin translation reopened the question of the relationship between faith and reason, calling into question differing points of view at a time when universities were being founded. John Locke shares his theory of knowledge in the 17th century and begins with his definition of ideas as anything that existed in the mind that could be expressed through words. Edward L. Thorndike wrote a book in 1914 called Education, a First Book. Thorndike is famous in psychology for his work on learning theory that led to the development of operant conditioning within behaviorism. Skinner was by no means the first psychologist to study learning by consequences. Indeed, Skinner's theory of operant conditioning is built on the ideas of Edward Thorndike. In Thorndike's book, he recognized the limitations of an education that relies on the teacher without the textbook and the textbook without the teacher. In analyzing the issues, he came to the conclusion that if there was a way to use technology in a programmatic fashion, then a lot of the issues would be resolved. And if you take a moment to look at the quotation, you'll see that he's already talking about the potential for programmed instruction. Societal needs in the 20s greatly influenced education. In 1923, the National Professional Organization for Visual Instruction was formed and eventually became the Association for Educational Communications and Technology. Instruction was connected to specific outcomes that reinforced the societal focus of that period. The emergence of individualized instructional plans occurred as well. Pressy was an educational psychologist and the developer of the first teaching machine to provide drill and practice exercises. He was influenced by Thorndike. You can see from the quote that at the age of 80, he was still quite dissatisfied with how schools were approaching learning. And this was back in the 1970s when he expressed this opinion. The impetus for Pressy developing this machine wasn't to replace the teacher, but to allow the teacher to focus on stimulating discourse that emphasizes critical thinking and still have a method of reinforcing information through repetition and concept building. The outcomes were that individuals were able to learn at their own pace with minimal instruction from the teacher. The ability to customize instruction based on specific learning outcomes in a self-paced environment fostered more development and addressed a need traditional classroom instruction couldn't fully deliver. The 1930s were about developing baseline objectives for education. The Great Depression had an impact on educational resources and funding, which in turn impacted the progress of instructional design. Ralph Tyler headed the evaluation staff of the eight-year study that addressed narrowness and rigidity in high school curricula. 
The impetus for the study was to address the existing high school curriculum in response to a huge upturn in the student population following World War I. This particular study involved a national program of 30 secondary schools and 300 colleges and universities, and it was instrumental in framing general education objectives. It also provided evidence that educational objectives could be clearly articulated in behavioral terms. And this was very important because it was the first instance of formative evaluation being utilized. The 1940s. With training needs skyrocketing as a result of World War II, soldiers had to be trained quickly and efficiently. The introduction of new weaponry required that soldiers be able to learn new skills. Subject specialists and technical experts teamed up with educators. The development of military training tools was accomplished by hiring seasoned researchers from 1941 to 1945 to work for the U.S. Office of Education. Specifically, the Division of Visual Aids for War Training was at the forefront of utilizing current technological innovations. As you can see from the production figures, numerous film strips, motion pictures, and instructor's manuals were developed at this time. And what's more, the U.S. government purchased 55,000 film projectors for use in instruction. Post-war, this practice continued and led to additional innovation in instruction. With the increased emphasis on technology, the concept of the instructional team emerged. Ben Avery Bush was an American engineer, inventor, and science administrator. He worked on radar antenna profiles and created tables for the calculation of artillery firing. Because of the repetitive and complicated mathematics that he had to work with, it led him to propose the development of an analog computer. And this was known as the Rockefeller Differential Analyzer. The idea of an online encyclopedia of knowledge was introduced in 1938 by forward-thinking H.G. Wells in his book, The World Brain. He introduced the concept of a network of subject-specific specialists who were not bound by location. Van Ever Bush reinforced Wells' vision and gave us a glimpse into the future when he wrote in the Atlantic Monthly about the need to develop a tool, the computer, to both aid and reinforce human recall. This would be the Memex, which was conceived in the 30s, but introduced in his article in 1945. The idea was the first glimpse into what would become hypertext research, and his article is frequently cited. In the 1950s, the launch of the space satellite Sputnik resulted with several events in the world that would eventually have a major impact on the instructional design process. The United States government, spurred on by the launch of the Sputnik, decided to spend a great deal of money on the development of instructional materials for math and for science. B.F. Skinner is noted for his research on operant conditioning. By controlling reinforcers, the learner is led to the desired behavior, the specific learning outcome. He began to apply operant conditioning when he developed programmed instruction. Essentially, Skinner builds on Thorndike's learning theory and on Pressey's teaching machine. In this particular case, the desired behavior is the ability to ensure that the learning has occurred for each individual exposed to this method. Operant conditioning differs from classical conditioning in that the form of learning that it involves modifies an individual's behavior as a result of consequences, whereas in classical conditioning, 
behaviors are not maintained by consequences, but rather by the learning process that occurs when there is an association made between events. Benjamin Bloom and his co-authors, a committee of college and university examiners, published the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, the Classification of Educational Goals in 1956. This resource was utilized to specify and analyze instructional outcomes. Learning objectives could be identified and instruction could be designed to foster these specific outcomes. Blooms allows users to rank and structure different classroom activities and to plan the learning process. The taxonomy is the taxonomy of activities and behaviors that exemplify higher order thinking skills and lower order thinking skills. In 2001, Lauren Anderson and others revised Bloom's original work, and the work now is referred to as Bloom's Revised Taxonomy. In this diagram, based on polls, learning to think, thinking to learn, you see Bloom's original terms from 1956, and then you see how these terms have been adapted in 2001. IBM Teaching Machines Project was instrumental in developing programs for teaching arithmetic and developing computer language that was specific to computer-assisted instruction. The distinguishing characteristics that separated these teaching machines from other forms of audiovisual media were based on operant conditioning theory. Students were actively engaged by responding to explicit cues that were reinforced through practice and subsequent testing, whether the student had met the learning objective. Each time, the student got immediate feedback and would know whether the response was correct or not, and this allowed the student to be led to make a direct or indirect correction. And the learning process was self-paced, so it allowed students who grasped information to move forward rapidly while allowing students who required more reinforcement to move at a pace necessary to achieve the learning outcome. The 1960s was about systems development, looking at more learning styles, and instructional design. Robert Glazer is responsible for coining the phrase instructional system and describing its com components. Systems development originated in the 60s and is really best described using a methodology known as the systems lifespan cycle. The systems lifespan cycle provides an ongoing process of analysis, development, application, testing, and evaluation. This cycle is key to instructional design in the future. Gagné, in his work, The Conditions of Learning, uses Bloom's taxonomy and links learning styles to specific instructional designs. He describes instructional theory as an attempt to relate the external events of instruction to the outcomes of learning by showing how these events lead to appropriate support or enhancement of internal learning processes. This required an analysis of tasks in order to identify each task as a discrete task, which in turn helped to define the sequence required so that a relationship hierarchy existed. Essentially, Gagné's task analysis built on Skinner's operant conditioning approach, which is a systematic approach to programmed instruction.